Some words of wisdom, your mileage may vary as with any words of wisdom, of course. Um, so let me start with a little bit about my background, just so you know the context for what I'm saying. I did my bachelor's at IIT Delhi in India and got my PhD in computer science from CMU a long time ago. You don't, not, don't want to know when. And I worked in industry research lab, that's NEC Labs America, for 19 plus years. Actually, that gives you a hint. And then I moved to academia, which is Princeton CS, about a year ago, just about a year ago. And let me say also a few words about my research interests. I'm primarily interested, and I have worked a lot, in verification, decision procedures, and more lately I'm interested in synthesis. So I have done a lot of work in these three layers of what I think of as my research framework, worked in constraint solvers like ASAT and SMT solvers, many algorithmic verification and analysis techniques like model checking, bounded model checking, and so on, and applied them using various modeling techniques to many different domains, hardware, software. More lately, I'm interested in systems. Again, the examples that I will give in the talk are part, you know, come, are drawn upon this experience. The details don't really matter here. So as you finish your PhD, and you know, Matt talked a lot about the lessons you should remember while you're a graduate student, and ponder this existential question, you know, maybe what you're really interested in understanding is whether or not to go to academia. And maybe it's because you love being a graduate student, you love your advisor, you'd want to do the kind of things he or she does. So by academia, I mean universities or teaching colleges. On the other side are industry jobs, and I'm going to use industry uh, very broadly to construe jobs in industry research labs, government labs, startups, or even what might be called advanced development. So as you ponder this question when you finish, I would say even after you have long finished your PhD, you may be thinking of a career transition. And so you may be faced with this question again, like I was about a year or two ago. And when discussing what I would talk about in this talk with Derek Dreyer, I was thinking like a Boolean SAT solver, okay, what are the different combinators here? And or not. And Derek says, let's stick with just the or. And let's add the question mark for suspense. So thanks, Derek. We added the question mark for suspense. So, and that got me thinking. You know, let me think of the other operators. So overloading the OR in C, you can think of it as a parallel operator, right? And yes, people in academia do consulting. They do sabbaticals with the industry. People in industry act as adjunct faculty. They like to teach, so they seek out these opportunities. I think what's really important is that the real world context that comes from industry informs both research and education. And that's the basis for many successful collaborations. You could think of other operators like the sequencing operator. So there's a lot of instances of people starting with academia and then moving to industry. These transitions are often based on personal preferences and there's also, of course, the appeal of designing and contributing to large systems at scale. The other transition, going from industry to academia, is somewhat less common. And I would say happens more because of changes happening in the industry. And like a PL researcher, I might get carried away and think about all the different regular language operators that might give me different combinations of these strings. OK, so let me stop right there. I'm going to talk about academia or industry. And if you Google search this for looking for nice images, this is the first one you see, and it's from my favorite source. I'll give you a few moments to read this. I love this. You know, you can get half a dozen papers, a thesis or two, and a paragraph in every textbook on queuing theory. And on the other side, all they want is to sync up their phones with Outlook. I would say there is some truth to this. However, more seriously, at a very coarse level of abstraction, let's think of an academic as a process A and an industry researcher as a process I. So what does an academic do? Forever, until eternity, 
Each day, they're going to do research. They're going to do some teaching. And every so often, because we are using a lot of abstraction, they will raise funds, they will do some mentoring, and they will do some service. And on the industry side, too, forever you will do research. Every so often, you will be asked to raise funds, do mentoring, and do some service. And the one difference you see immediately is that there's no teaching on this side. So teaching is indeed one big difference. And don't let anybody tell you otherwise. It takes a lot of time and a lot of energy. You've got to love it to do it. And it's not a bug. It's a feature. So if you like doing it, that's what's the side you should be on. Or find ways to do it even if you're on this side. So let's get that out of the way. Let's look at some of the other stuff, you know, raising funds. Supposedly, people talk about it as if it's a big burden in academia. But I'll tell you, most academics I ta have talked with love the opportunity of making fresh and exciting restarts that they get. You can abandon your previous project after three years. You know, who wants to do more of it? Every three years, you're going to start a new project and do that in a pipeline. Very exciting. That's when you do a lot of your good thinking. Industry research also have to raise sort of funds in a different way. They have to persuade higher ups. Because if you want to work on a project, you want to work in some area, you can't really say, oh, I do it because I want to. You have to give some justification for your existence and do some persuasion. Of course, there's less internal competition. But deliverables can sometimes go way beyond just publications and building research prototypes. You know, maybe you'll be asked to do technology transfer or show it working on real large challenging examples. And that's a good thing. Let's shift to mentoring. In academia, of course, student mentoring is super important. And that's what we are all here for in some sense. Industry mentoring junior team members is equally important if you want to build a successful team, if you want to have successful projects. Serving internal service that goes towards building an organization, doing recruiting, helping people to your, you know, believe in your cause are all valued and essential. External service, and by this I mean service to the research community in terms of reviewing in terms of conference organizing, serving on PCs, editorships, and so on, is definitely a core part of academia. But the priority varies among different industries and maybe even over time. So we've, you know, at some level, the aspects of raising funds, training and mentoring, and service, I believe, are somewhat similar aspects of a job, although the emphasis can vary. So where are the differences? In my experience, the differences are in the autonomy that you have. Academia does allow more autonomy and control of, for an individual. This is operational day to day, as well as strategy and planning year to year. Something that you often hear about, academic freedom, don't believe that it's total freedom. If you want to do funded research, academic freedom is constrained by the funding agencies. Of course, you may want to do unfunded research or not do research at all. That's also freedom of some kind. But you know that's what academic freedom comes with. In terms of collaborations, impressionable graduate students on the academia side versus trained PhDs and professionals. And I have to tell you, the trained PhD professionals are a joy. But so are the students. And from my own experience, there's joy in both kinds of collaborations. And with effort, if you're interested, you can build both. In terms of resources, yes, they are much easier to marshal in industry. But they come with some strings attached. If you're going to get a lot of resources, surely someone is going to have higher expectations of you. And that also is fine. You know, you're trying. It's good to have higher expectations, good to aim high and get the resources, I think the tricky situation is when the resources are tight, but the expectations are high. So this is something you should watch out for. Ask a lot of questions when you're considering specific companies or specific projects. Are the resources tight and the expectations high? 
my advice, take it with caution. So, you know, getting back to our process analogy, I feel like the differences really are that the system environment is different. You know, autonomy, resources, and uh, collaborations. At an individual process, I might even say they are very similar and uh, some variations, but it's really the system environment that is different. So I haven't yet talked about the main part, which is what really moves us all, which drives us, which is research. Good research is the same in both places. The driver for good research is impact. And we've already heard this several times since the morning, that go after research with impact. The good news is that there's many ways to make research impact. You can do it with a well-cited publication. You can do it by contributing to new foundations or new applications. You can also do it by showing applications that are old but can be done at scale. And you need similar skills, I would say, for success, whether you are an academic or you are in industry, you need deep expertise and you need great communication skills. Because nobody's going to know what you know unless you take the effort to explain it, to write it, to disseminate it. There's some emphasis between foundations and applications that can vary. It can vary in different companies. It can also vary over time. Again, my advice is to ask, to talk with a lot of people, ask a lot of questions about where the emphasis is, whether you're contributing to foundations or to applications. And in some sense, the real world context, I believe, is becoming increasingly important for impact. And from my own experience, I would say that successful technology transfers are immensely satisfying. And in the area of verification, you may have all heard about the static driver verification project at MSR. And we had a similar project with Varwell program verification at NEC that I was involved in for a long time. This is just a very, very brief uh, summary of what we did as part of this project. It is basically an in-house product, so we were not trying to sell it, for verifying memory safety in large C and C++ programs. The way it works is we start off with using a build analyzer that works directly on make files. And this is just taking the project as it is, some with millions of lines of code. Then we do a very lightweight static analysis to infer design constraints and create compilable units automatically somewhere in the range of hundreds of thousands of lines of code. And this typically would take 10 minutes. And then for each compilable unit and for each entry function inside that compilable unit, we would apply verification in parallel on functions that could be as big as tens of thousands of lines of code. And thankfully, the technology for program analysis and verification can handle that level of granularity. So what we would do is we would first build a model, took about a minute, then we would just do proofs on for the various properties we had instrumented, and it would, within 10 minutes, discharge close to 80% automatically of all the instrumented memory safety properties, and the remaining properties we would give to a bounded model checker that would find bugs using a SAT solver. And this would typically only require about two minutes, and we did get about 40% true bugs, and this number is climbing. The important point in all of this is that the effort that it took to build this entire thing, which is, I would say, push button automatic, at least up to the point that the bugs are post-processed, required about three to five researchers working full time, required a team of 10 developers, working close to seven plus years. And yes, we published a lot. You know, at the least we published 35 and you know, taking a broader view, maybe close to 50 papers coming out of this project. More importantly, what was really nice is that this project got applied in production when on 50 plus projects in a typical year, applied on many, many millions of lines of code in total, some that were beyond our expectation. I mean, 20 million lines of code, 
Sometimes my question was, who writes 20 million lines of code? Well, many people do. And one of our NEC customers did. So I, looking at these numbers, it's hard to imagine that I would have been able to do this, being part of academia. And being in the industry, having the uh, goal to make, in, to m turn into reality what I knew could work for program analysis and verification was a great opportunity. And it was a fantastic team that I had that I would actually give a lot of credit to for being able to do something like this. And I'm you know, immensely grateful for the opportunity that industry gave me to do that. And in some sense, I want to carry those lessons back into working with academia, in academia with my students now. And let me shift gears a little and talk about technology. We all know the technology is driving rapid changes in society. The good news for you all is that CS enrollments are up, way up. So there's a lot more academic jobs for you. Here's some data from the CRA Talby survey. And as you can see, you know, from 2014 even, we are higher than the highest we were in past in terms of enrollment in CS. At Princeton, I can tell you, it's an Ivy League liberal arts, proud to be a liberal arts school. The enrollment in CS courses is the highest of any discipline on campus. And for the la first time last year, the number of declared majors of computer science was higher than econ by one. But we are proud of it. <laughs> and we hope to grow that. So the good news, like I said, for all of you interested in academia, at least these days, the CS enrollments are up, so there are more academic jobs. The good news continues because the technology companies are also doing really well. In your Popple materials, you all got this blue thing from Facebook. And I'm just reading off of it. It says, at Facebook, research permeates everything we do. Great news, right? And our engineers work to solve real world problems that impact millions of people. So what more can you ask for? It's a fantastic opportunity to be a PL researcher these days. So like I said, at Amazon, Facebook, Google, Samsung, they all have many new PL related groups in addition to the established groups that you all may already know at Microsoft and at IBM and other companies. I would say that the line between R&D is getting thinner. You know, that's part of the changing technology landscape today. There may be no research labs at Facebook. Actually, I don't know whether they have it or not. But yes, they are involved in building cutting edge know-how, in building cutting edge systems. So whether you call it development or you call it research, or advanced development, the idea of you utilizing your research skills to solve important problems, to solve difficult and challenging complex problems, those opportunities exist in a lot of places. And that's what I, and there's also a lot of lateral movement within the industry and between industry and academia. So I'm sure you all saw with some sense of sadness the closing of Microsoft research in Silicon Valley, there's movements in the other direction too. And you know, entire groups from academia have been picked up to go work in the industry. And maybe Uber will want to buy your robotics department next. My own experience has been in my group at NEC Labs at various times. Of the nine or 10 people that we had, Five of us actually ended up in academia, including one postdoc person currently. Four of us went to different industry uh, organizations, and two went to startups. So as you can see, not just at an individual level, but even at the group level, because of the shifts in technology, because of the shifts in priority, I believe there's a lot more lateral movement today than there used to be before. One other thought to keep in mind as you ponder the question, is this difference or I would say interrelationship between research and innovation? So here's my favorite quote from the inventor of the post-it notes who said that research is the transformation of money into knowledge and innovation is the transformation of knowledge into money. 
And yes, both of those transformations are you know, exciting. As a grad student, hopefully this is all you're doing. Maybe on the side you might be doing this too. But my advice is whether in academia or in industry, it's useful for you to identify which transformation you are engaged in. It may vary by a project stage. At different stages of the project, you might be doing more of knowledge transformation and later on transforming it into money. Or it might even vary based on your current assignment. For an academic, you might be doing consulting or some startup work while on leave. Or you may even be assigned to some business unit to learn more about the business processes and so on. No matter what, you should, for your own self-awareness, identify which transformation you are part of because that really sets the expectations and the value that you will bring to whatever job you're doing. Another point I would make is that there's a huge demand for accelerated pace in both these transformations. So people, of course, always want this to be faster, but that puts pressure because where are you going to get the knowledge to turn it into money? You're going to get it from here. So it places a lot of pressure also for this transformation to become faster. And that creates a lot of opportunities, but it requires agility on your part. So let me close and summarize some of the important points that I hope you will agree, and I'm happy to take questions on all of those. I believe these are very exciting times to be a PL researcher. There are more jobs in academia and more jobs in the industry. As to the question of academia or industry, I hope that I showed you some sense of the ways in which they are similar, but there's also some critical differences too. I would say that the choice that you make is not cast in stone, but you have to stay competitive with your, the top peer group in whichever place you want to be at. Finally, for us all, what really matters, what's close to our heart, is to do research with impact. I will say that it's no longer confined to either academia or industry research labs. In fact, the accelerated pace of technology innovations are creating so many new opportunities. Go find them. And wherever you go, keep this advice from Bill Watterson in mind. No matter how many eggs you're juggling, persistence will pay off. Thank you so much for listening. I answered them all. I think even if you didn't put the constraint of being close to family or home. OK, let me repeat the question. The question, if I understood it correctly, is when PhD students want to work in academia, another thing they might want to try and optimize is being close to family and home. And is that easier or worse than trying to find a job in industry? Unfortunately, the numbers are such that even if you did not put the constraint of being close to family and home, the ch you know the numbers of jobs in academia are still way smaller than the numbers of jobs in industry. So yes, it's a constraint satisfaction problem, and you can put your own weights to the different constraints you're going to put in there. Um, I would say the reasons that draw you to academia uh, you know, have to take, in some sense, it's so much. Each job is so hard and so challenging that uh, you know, if you started to also optimize being closer to home and family at the start of your career, it just places additional constraints. I think what I have seen in practice is people take those constraints more into account as life goes on. And when they are at a different stage of life, it starts to matter a lot more. So my advice for what it's worth, when you're starting your career, 
don't think so much about it. If you do good work where you are, you will find a way to satisfy your other constraints later on in life. Definitely. Definitely. In fact, I think as computer science is maturing, PL technologies are maturing, there'll be more, there are, at least today, many more opportunities closer to home for anybody who wants to make that a high priority. So I can talk based on my own experience. Um, I think I would say that all the years that I put in into an industry position, I thought of myself as an academic anyway. <laughs> and I worked very hard to do the kind of things that an academic does, which was be very visible in the research community, kept up the list of publications. And that's sort of what I meant. You know. Many times, some positions will offer you the flexibility and the freedom to, in some sense, create your own job description. Take that flexibility and take that freedom to go after what you believe will get you to your next level in your career. So yes, it's harder, A, because of the sheer number of positions, obviously. But on the other hand, it's also your own mindset and your own expectations. And for me, I will tell you, I really miss the big team and fantastic people I had to work with. But I'm also looking forward to grow this uh, slowly but surely uh, in the academic setting. Thank you.